Hi, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'm so delighted to be joined here today with our community members and our special guest, Paul O'Mahony. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. So, Paul, today we're going to be talking about crossing the sea migration in the ancient world. But before we get into the topic, I'd like to just share a little bit about you and your work, because you do so many um, beautiful things. So I want to let everyone know first that you're artistic director of Out of Chaos, with whom you created Unmissable, which won three Week's Editor's Award in Edinburgh in 2012. Uh, Unmissable has also toured in more than 80 theaters across the UK, Europe, and New Zealand. Uh, you helped to found Out of Chaos, which in 2008 uh, became an award-winning um, project. And uh, with your co-founder, you also wrote uh, the, the project Norsum. And you have also recently toured in a two-man Macbeth in the UK. You are a very accomplished actor who has included stints with companies such as the Orange Tree Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and the English Touring Opera, just to name a few. Uh, you're Associate Director of Actors from the London Stage and Associate Producer uh, at, is it the German Street Theatre? Right? German Street Theatre, that's right, yep. Great. Um, where you have, where your credits include All That Fall uh, and St. John's Night, as well as Mother Adam. In 2011, you adapted three Greek tragedies to create The House of Atreus, which was produced at the Barbican in London. Um, you have also just recently, I think, completed a full-length musical. Is that correct? Great. Yes. Delphi. Uh, and in 2015, you directed Much Ado About Nothing, um, you have studied classics at Oxford University where you twice won prizes. Uh, you were also awarded uh, an ancient history scholarship. And I just want to let know, everyone know, in addition to all that, you were also the director of outreach at the Kalas Gallery in London. So Paul, you're a very busy man, very creative, um, and we're so delighted you're taking time to join us today. Oh, well, I'm delighted to, to be here. Thank you for inviting me back. So um, we did, during our little pre-session here, we did experience a few technical problems. So if that happens today, I hope our, uh, our viewers will just kind of stick with us. Uh, if necessary, we can um, kind of reschedule this, this event, but I think it's going to work. So uh, let's give it a go. So Paul, help us think about um, migration, right? So this is a topic that you chose for us to think about today. It's such a timely topic. So many of us are thinking uh, and dealing with this with some of these issues. So can you help us think about why, uh, why you chose this topic and about how the ancient world depicts, depicts this theme? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was a topic actually that, uh, that we came up with a, f a few months ago as well. So um, uh, and it's sort of perhaps even more timely now than we first discussed it a few months ago. Um, <clears throat> And the idea of migration and of sort of crossing the sea, I suppose, is something that has been to me for a very long time, partly because I used to live next to the sea. Um, and uh, so I was constantly sort of on the shores of the, of the wine dark sea. Um, uh, and also uh, on a personal level, um, I've been in Ireland a bit recently, kind of tracking down relatives. My father is Irish. Um, and finding out about migrated across to America and indeed sort of across to the UK and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, um, the, the migration and the refugee crisis that's happening currently in um, Italy and around Greece sort of sharp uh, relief. So it seems to me that this idea of crossing the sea, the dangers of the sea, um, but also sort of the opportunities that it provides um, is sort of more relevant than, than ever, really. Um, and one of the passages of always sort of thought was kind of incredibly powerful is, um, is the, the return of the, the 10,000 as they're sort of, you know, kind of getting out of uh, Persian territory and then at last they see the sea. Um, and that sort of idea of, uh, you know, sort of thalassa or thalata, sort of being passed back and that excitement and sort of the, the essence of Greekness being kind of somehow connected to, to the sea is something that sort of has kind of stayed with me for, for a very long time. Right. And so, you know, um, you, sort of sorry, that, please. That first, first, first studied as a, when I was a student. Oh, okay. Wonderful. So this is kind of a long-term um, 
thing that has been on your mind. And, you know, I think what's so touching is the some of the passages that you chose for us today to consider mm -hmm. and think about. I know you have some images for us to think about as well as some additional passages. Um, yep. So I I'm wondering if maybe we could begin by looking at one of those. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I suppose actually, um, perhaps what I'll what I'll start off with, if I may, then is um, just a, a, just a really this is a really short additional reading that I was yeah. um, looking at, which is um, from Sappho, which is um, over the fisher Pelagon meniscus his father set the oar, worn by the wave, the trap for all men and forever memorials there, there to be of the luckless life of the fisher, the labourer of the sea. Um, and one of the things that sort of keeps uh, returning, the idea of sea is sort of, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a giver of life, but, but it's also a taker of life and the inherent dangers within crossing the sea. And <clears throat> one kind of good example for that, I suppose, is also, um, the number of votive offerings that we find ecologically sort of from the ancient world that are to do with either saying kind of, you know, obviously, you know, please let me have a safe crossing or crossing. Um, uh, there's uh, an image of a horse, which I've sent over. Um, Great. And I think Sarah can share that for us. So we'll just take a moment to bring that up. Um, so Paul, this image, um, can you help mm. us? I know this is something that, um, this object you actually get to work with, right? This is an object that I get to work with. So this, um, I mean, this object, okay, first of all, I should say it, it's a votive offering and exactly what it's a votive offering for. We, you know, I can't sort of say with any, um, any certainty at all about whether it is to do with um, someone's sea voyage, but it's, the, it's typical of a votive offering um, Horse. And this is a, a beautiful geometric period bronze horse that's on display at Kalos Gallery, which is, uh, and for whom I do outreach work. Um, so this is one of the objects that, that um, sometimes when I'm visiting schools or other sort of learning groups, universities, um, whoever it is who maybe has a, a, an interest in learning about the ancient world, this is one of the objects that um, I can take with me. For for people to see up close and to handle and to and to look at, and it's an amazing example of um, of a geometric horse. Uh, it's say from around about sort of seven hundred and fifty BC. Beautiful. And can you give us a sense of the size? Because it sounds like you're moving that around. It's hard to tell from the. Um, the sense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I suppose at its highest, it's probably about sort of uh, five or six inches tall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. That's super helpful to, because yeah, so it's, I was imagining it's it pretty small, really. Yeah. Oh, wow. So such a little masterpiece. And so, um, so you're saying these kind of bronze offerings are very traditional and maybe not necessarily just as horse, but in terms of uh, honoring the, that journey, the safe journey. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I suppose sort of there's, there's a possibility that this could, this horse could have been to do with, with sea voyages. I mean, linking into Poseidon and the imagery that's sometimes used for him um, but there's no guarantee that that might be um, what this particular one was for that story is sort of is long right. gone to us I suppose um, but the number of votive offerings that we find and the dedications that we find that, uh, sort of pillars, lost fishermen um, I think tells of sort of the danger of um, of crossing the sea in the ancient world right Great. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that in looking over the passages that we saw and in that passage that you just read, um, just this beautiful sense of longing and about how that is so captured um, by this song culture, right? Not just a longing to get home safely, but also um, the longing of people who are disconnected from their homes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, that's something that um, comes up hugely in the Odyssey and Odysseus's quest for Nostos and um, and also in the Aeneid with um, with Aeneas's sort of sense of destiny of of a very different homecoming really of, of you know founding a, a second home 
mm-hmm. with the second Troy. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that appears again and again. The very in fact, the very opening of the of the Odyssey is another passage I was sort of just maybe if I could just read a little bit of that. Sure, please. Um, so, um, uh, Andra Moy, Polo Trope on Hosmala, Olla, Planti, Epitroia, Tierum, Tolietheron, Epersen, Polon, Danthropon, Iden, Astia, Kainoon, Egnoi, Pola, Dohen, Ponto, Ipathen, Algea, Hon, Catathimon, Harnuminos, Hain, Tepsukain, Kainoston, Hetairon, Stanley Lombardo's translation, Speak Memory of the cunning hero, own of course time and again after he plundered Troy's sacred heights. Speak of all the cities he saw, the minds he grasped, the suffering deep in his heart at sea as he struggled to survive and bring his men home. Mm-hmm. So beautiful. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a really kind of wonderful kind of passage. Um, and then another early passage from the Obviously, I think is in our uh, um, sort of also sort of in our uh, sort of the the list of mm-hmm. passages. Sure, in the little handout which is posted, uh, people handout, can absolutely. people can access that uh, at the Castle and Society mm-hmm. site on the blog post associated with this. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, so, um, mm, please. Well, I was just going to see if any of our community members had a comment or question so far, just a reaction to some of the passages that we're thinking about, or just to the theme in general, um, or the image, anyone? Yes, Maria. Oh, okay, sorry, then Jack, after Maria. Maria first. Uh, Jack can go first, and I will follow. Okay. Oh, so sweet. Okay, Jack. Oh, I just had a quick uh, comment about uh, uh, the Iliad and uh, how it's mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, the warriors were uh, out there risking death, uh, patres, you know, far from their homeland. And uh, it's, you know, one of those brief, uh, soulful uh, expressions um, that uh, I think comes up uh, several times in the Iliad. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it was one thing that these passages are bringing forward to me are that we might be able to make some distinctions, I think, between, let's say, people who are just, um, let's say, away fighting war. Okay, so that's one kind of separation from a homeland or one kind of migration, as opposed to, I think, some of the passages, Paul, that you asked us to read, where you really hear from individuals, um, for instance, uh, who are, are sort of in the midst of the journey, right? seeking a new homeland, which is mm. a kind of a different situation, right? As opposed to the Achaeans who come to the shores of Troy uh, in an attempt to sack, um, it's sort of a different plight. And so, you know, I think one thing we've seen in as a community on many fronts is that the song culture is very attuned to the suffering of these groups, right? On the one hand, uh, it's a song culture devoted to uh, the class of the ton, the imperishable fame of of some of these heroes, while at the same time it is so beautifully expressing uh, the, ex- you know, the terrible suffering of um, of the people who are forced to, uh, you know, who who have been sold into slavery, those who are have lost their homeland and who and who are moving. Um, yeah. So, but I, I know even Maria. Those, yeah. No, no, go, Paul, please. I'll say, and even those sort of not sold into slavery, but you know, a great great hero like it is his alia are sort of you know at the forefront of of the odyssey right you know, they are right up there in the first three and four lines that this is that he is someone who has suffered things on the sea right 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 that even the hero cannot escape right maria i know you had a comment or question I would just like to uh, bring into discussion uh, some uh, very, I think, important uh, concepts that were introduced to what we may call migration studies. Uh, I'm actually thinking that uh, 
uh, in general, the Mediterranean Sea and the Mediterranean area, in a way, is a very special case of migration for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and I'm actually thinking to Irad Malkin's, uh, Mal Malkin's uh, book, Connect connectivity you know uh, about the the essence and the concept of connectivity he brings into into the uh, into understanding of the mediterranean world uh, uh, claudia very nicely put it about you know uh, the the cleos how heroes in the homeric world move uh, to other places in order uh, to flee from war but also there are other cases for example where the conflict takes place, for example, in a metropolis, in their own city, and then they have to go away from home. So it is on, it's not only homecoming, but also having to get away from home. You know, so, so I'm thinking, for example, colonization and uh, colonies that were established, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in other parts of the Mediterranean world. So I, I just uh, would like uh, our guests uh, view on that about connectivity and migration. I think the two concepts feed uh, to one another. Hi, uh, Paul, are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I am there. Sorry, yeah, I, I, it went in and out, but I think I, I, think I um, caught the majority of it, which is to do with um, it's about people fleeing rather than um, simply a case of, of homecoming. Is, is, that, is that correct? I think the um, what uh, what uh, I I just uh, I wanted to add that as you rightly mentioned, the sea as a, a medium in a way which connects people around the Mediterranean world in a way forms this geographical area along with its land and in a way renders it a very um, special case of uh, uh, of migration of area of migration and uh, I think that the sea provides in a way connectivity this is not uh, I, I haven't coined the the concept Irad Malkin has actually coined the very uh, theory of connectivity, like we have the sea, and the sea is what connects people and allow them, and allows them to move around the Mediterranean world. And uh, so there are not only people fleeing uh, from an area, from a dangerous area where there is a war or a massacre taking place, but on the other hand, there are, for example, places where a civil strife takes place. For example, many Greek cities uh, on a Greek mainland. That's why, for example, we have many Greek colonies all around the Mediterranean world. So, as you, I, I actually want, in a way, to connect with what you said, with the very concept of what you just said about the sea. That, in a way, sea is what brings connect connectivity. So, we don't have only one facet or one aspect or one. Um, meaning of migration. There are very, I think it's a multifaceted concept, this uh, um, uh, notion, this concept of, of uh, migration, because in Mediterranean, uh, uh, in the Mediterranean area, is the sea that makes it uh, so multifaceted. I think, that's, I think that's really important, and I think you can see that um, really coming alive in, in Greek art, particularly as well, that, that what's happening a great deal is sort of, it's not, not always just the migration of people, but the migration of ideas as well. Um, and, you know, you look sort of at the, actually, this might be quite a good opportunity to, to show the Sinian um, goblet um, image, uh, which I had sent over. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, uh, and this is um, another object, um, uh, an example of which is on display at, at the Kalos Gallery as well um, in London. And it's a, sort of a typical Mycenae goblet from about 1200 BC. So one of the reasons I've picked this object in particular is that, to me, it really speaks as an object about the world of the Odyssey. 
that I can imagine Odysseus sort of sharing, you know, with the Phaeacians and uh, uh, even potentially being sort of a, you know, a Xenia gift between them um, with these traditional Murex designs on it, again, talking, you know, sort of pointing towards the importance of the sea. Um, <clears throat> but it's the ability to travel across the sea and to meet other cultures that Greece as well, or the ancient Greeks, to come out of its dark ages, to be able to trade with the Phoenicians, who are the princes of the sea in the Bible, and to trade with the Egyptians as well, and to, to share ideas. Uh, and sort of that idea of connectivity is so important, and I suppose that's um, sort of interested in, in terms of looking at the sea as being sort of a, a provider it's sort of a giver of life and opportunity sort of the opportunities to trade and to share ideas culturally mm. Mm. beautiful i think jack may have a follow-up comment he's just going to unmute it'll take a moment mm -hmm. oh jack we still can't hear you can you unmute your microphone yeah there it is I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Uh, yes, uh, several of us were uh, reading, and we just finished uh, reading last week, uh, Pender's Pythian Four, his longest ode that has that long epic uh, account of, of the uh, voyage of the Argonauts. And oh. it's so uh, interesting how it's uh, sandwiched uh, between the introduction uh, that deals with the establishment of Cyrene, the, the um, uh, prophecy of Medea that's you know, very detailed about how uh, Cyrene will be established in time after quite a few other voyages and quite a few other wanderings. Uh, and then at the end, you know, it's sort of like a uh, black and white uh, ascent, descent, uh, you know, uh, complementary uh, opposites. Um, Pender begs for the rest restoration of Demophilus, uh, Cyrenian uh, exile, uh, and, you know, puts in a really very uh, strong uh, uh, plea, uh, like a like a lawyer's argument for uh, bringing Demophilus home, you know, after this uh, tremendously uh, great canvas describing the dangerous voyage, and he t uses the word kindness um, at very uh, key uh, parts at the at the very beginning, you know what. Um, what was it that uh, brought that them to take on that tenderness, that uh, f that uh, voyage for to bring back the golden fleece, and uh, and then later its uh, uh, tenderness appears as sort of a light light motif. Uh, anyway, I, I I think the um, the Pender's Pythian Four you know, deserves to be mentioned up there, you know, with the Odyssey as, you know, a great uh, story of uh, voyage and adventure. Thanks, Jack. So what do you think about that, Paul? I mean, here we have um, another example of this, of this dangerous voyage um, in this beautiful, um, exquisite, uh, perfected lyric, right? Do you, oh, um, well, I, I'm just wondering, do you, yeah, do you have a reaction to this idea of, uh, of this depiction? Of, of, the, of the depiction of, of the Argonauts in, in Pindu yeah, 4? Yeah, because I, well, I, I'm excited because I know that you have thought a, a great deal about the Argonauts, right? I, <laughs> yes, I have. I've, uh, I've even, I've even pl I've played Jason twice in my <laughs> okay. different productions. So uh, one, one more seriously than the other. I have to say. Um, <clears throat> I think there's, um, there's sort of something, isn't there, about, about sort of the, uh, about the, the epic 
quality of of sort of mission that sort of voyage against what Jack's calling also then sort of the the tenderness um, of of homecoming and I think it I think it sort of speaks towards as well sort of this sort of the of the sea that the sea can great things and it can provide comfort and happiness and homecoming but it also provides sort of sort of danger at every turn be that from uh, the the elements uh, be that god or be that from the numerous cases of you know pirates and whatnot so it must have been an incredibly sort of uh, uh, i think for for any person who was voyaging across the sea on um, in a sort of a regular way in the ancient world these these uh, these myths um of, of of crossing the sea um incredibly powerful really in a way that it's possibly harder for us to relate to now when most of us most sea voyages are you know are, are pretty safe like we know that the boat is is going to get there um uh, but there's i was um, i was reading something from mary beard recently talking about uh, uh, an epitaph for someone sort of boasting about them making 72 voyages in the course of their life and sort of how extraordinary that was that you know they they made seven, they made 72 and survived and um, so it's sort of um, but the sea was yeah had, had this sort of kind of dual role in people's lives of opportunity but then also um, snatching it away and snatching everything away. Yeah. Uh, so one of the places I've had a chance to live in my life is a town called Gloucester in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's a very big, uh, traditionally a, a fishing town. And so they have um, a fisherman's memorial there where you can see, uh, you know, sort of the names of all those who have gone down to the sea and ships. Um, and it is uh, overwhelming, actually, when you stand there and look at all the names. I mean, it, the list is so, so long and overwhelming. Uh, you know, and it, that tradition, uh, it, it's still a very dangerous job. Um, but you can see sort of around the, you know, 50s and 60s that the list gets smaller every year. But um, the sea took its due every year on that community, year after year, in an unending, um, in an unending kind of scourge. And yet the whole town depended on it. Uh, and men and women kept devoting their lives to it. It's quite an amazing thing. Absolutely. And, and you could see that sort of, yeah, I've lived on the coast and sort of anywhere you go along the coast where there are fishing communities, there are those memorials, aren't they? They are sort of, they are universal because it is a dangerous uh, place. Yeah. Um, and, and yet communities can thrive because of the sea. Yeah, it takes us back to your beautiful Sappho passage you opened us with. Janet, you had a comment or question. Uh, you know, uh, my husband sails, uh, and every time I think you go on the water, you, you are uh, in danger. It, it can happen. Even the, uh, in a small river, water is uh, dangerous. And I think uh, every time you have that in mind. Uh, um, on the point of being disconnected from the people uh, from home, I was wondering when, you know, if you die uh, in the sea and you don't have a tomb and you're, even in that, you are disconnected. You, you, you're, you have, uh, you're gone and your family couldn't bury you. And that is horrible, horrible feeling that you, you cannot even give a proper burial. And then, right. right. So, so there's this danger too, not just of being in this distant land, right? But uh, this level of vulnerability uh, while you are en route and, and in that transitional uh, liminal period, right? There's something incredibly scary about that. And as you say, Jenna, especially about the sea, um, what what are you thinking, Paul? Um, yeah, so when I get, sometimes my connection is dropping a little bit, but that's okay. We so we still appreciate you being, sticking oh, with us. Oh no, not I'm, but, um, but that was talking about sort of the the possibility then of of, of burial not happening. Was that was that mm -hmm. right? I, I was sort of making that up. So um, yeah, sort of, sort of 
makes me think of uh, Aeneid, book six, uh, and the passage with with, uh, with Charon down, yeah. um, down in, in the underworld. Paul, you know, you did select two passages for us from the Aeneid. Do you think you could read one mm -hmm. of those for us? Do you have, I mean, uh, I could, um, yeah, they're actually, both so wondered, powerful. Uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, because um, um, I've been reading, reading the Seamus Heaney version of okay. book six, the translation. So um, I've got that to, to hand, okay. um, but it's, uh, it's a fateful rendering. So um, it will match up well to, to what there is there. Um, and this is, this is um, Aeneas and the underworld with the Sybil. It's here that leads to Acheron River. Here too is the roiling abyss, heaving with mud, venting a silty upsurge into Cocytus, and beside these flowing streams and flooded wastes, wastes watch surly, filthy, and bedraggled Charon. His chin is bearded with unclean white shag, and his head and glow. A grimy cloak flaps out from a knot tied at the shoulder. All by himself he poles the boat, hoists sail and ferries dead souls in his rusted craft. But still a god, and in a god old age is green and hardy. The crowd came pouring into the banks, women and men and noble-minded heroes separated now from their living flesh. Married girls and sons cremated before their father's eyes, continuous as the streaming leaves nipped off by first frost in the autumn woods or flocks of birds blown inland from the stormy ocean when the year turns cold and drives them to migrate to countries in the sun. Those souls, begging to be the first allowed across, stretching out arms that hankered towards the farther shore. Permits one group to board and now another, but the rest he denies passage, driving them back away from the sandy banks. And then moved by all this press and pleading, Aeneas asks his guide, what does it mean, O Sybil, this push to the riverbank? What do these souls desire? What decides that one group is held back, another rode across the muddy waters? These, the venerable one replied. Son of heaven, what you see here are the standing pools of Cocytus and the Stygian marsh invoked when gods swear oaths they will never dare to break. In front of you died, buried, with no help or hope. The ones on board his craft have found way across these gurgling currents, their doom instead to wander and haunt about the banks for a hundred years. Then, and then only, are they again allowed to approach the brink and waters that they long for. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, th this raises a, to a, a, a new theme, right? Completely. Not only does it reflect the theme that you have already been asking us to think about in terms of these, uh, the danger of the unburied bodies, right, Janet and, and Paul, um, that you have having us think about, but then the dead, right? The souls of the dead as those who are migrating. Um, that makes, I think that makes this kind of migration um, even more universalized in some way, right? As part of human yeah. experience that your soul- Absolutely, yeah. they all do, which is die, then sort of it involves them of the sea, well, of, yeah. of the waters, I should say, rather than the sea. Right, right, right. right. Then sort of, you know, you have the heartbreaking kind of, you know, meeting with Palinurus immediately afterwards. Um, right. Realisation that sort of, you know, even even if you are sort of a hero, you'll have the same rules in in death. Um, uh, and you still sort of, you know, you still have to, <clears throat> you know, you still have to have burial. We are, I suppose, you know, there is perhaps in those, in those moments of, of death and the need to, to cross the sea. The water. And in it's so many ways, I mean, that passage, passage, yeah, for me, that passage is really resonating with the very opening of the Iliad, right? Where one of the first things we hear is that the anger of Achilles has sent the souls of heroes um, down below. So uh, mm. this is sort of the, 
the other side of that coin, right? And suddenly we look below the stage and, and here we see, um, yeah, what's happening. Any other reactions, comments or questions to what we've done so far? Oh, I think Jack may have something. Jack is unmuting. Yep, it'll take just a second, Jack, you could do it. Yay. Yeah, I'm sorry, my mouse uh, pad seems to w wander. Uh, well, this is just such a, a, a great uh, passage in the, in the uh, history of Western literature, uh, sort of sandwiched between Odyssey Book 11 and uh, Dante's Inferno. Uh, it, and it's, you know, it's, it uh, is, is really uh, awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so moving the, um, that imagery of the people sort of on the shore, like sort of reaching out, stretching out the hands and just one or two being taken, right? And the rest yeah. sort of being left behind. Yeah. The pathos and that, and, and, is certainly there. And there are images like that that we, that, you know, that we have seen, which is sort of you know, part of what's sort of so extraordinary with kind of some of the things that are, that are going on sort of uh, in the world, but sort of in Europe with you know, the refugee crisis that yeah. reaching out and some get chosen and, and others don't. Um, right, yeah. Paul, I think you have some passages, uh, some images also, right, about Aeneas? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so one, of the, one of the reasons as well that I was about the uh, Aeneas and about crossing the sea is that, um, <clears throat> that the, the story of Aeneas or leaving, uh, getting on a boat, bad things happening on boats, and then going to different places and and um, getting sort of a stormy reception uh, is, is you know uh, more relevant today than probably ever. And um, so there was a, a an image um, of Aeneas with his father Anchises, um, which is obviously sort of quite a kind of famous um, image, and then. Uh, uh, also, sort of, this is a number of one of a number of different images of, of refugees today, which um, sort of been documented of people sort of having to to carry their their elderly relatives, their fathers, and of course their children and whoever else as well, sort of um, as they um, uh, and so I think the story of of Aeneas <clears throat> is personally you know, this sort of. One of the one of the pillars of of you know, sort of the Western world, or, you know, one of the you know the creator of Rome position as well, and of course the story of when he arrives in Italy that it's not it's not all smooth at all, uh, and it does take it does take um, time. Right. So, so yeah, this was a, yeah, a strong image that sort of that sort of brought me to the Iliad or back to the Iliad. Right. Yes. I mean, I think we can, you know, the images that are seen on the news on a daily basis are so striking. And I know um, mm. for our community members who are in places such as Greece right now, uh, such images are very strong. Right. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, Paul, I wonder if now you could actually help us think as, you know, as an actor and as a performer, um, have you had opportunities to do much uh, in terms of connecting with characters uh, who are refugees or migrants or um, that sense of dislocation? And, and what is it like to, to play that? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Actually, um, something that springs to mind is, is uh, being on the, the opposite side of that, actually, is um, I, oh gosh, about, about 10 years ago now, played um, Pelasgus, Argos in a production of East Phyllis's Suppliants. Ah, okay. Um, can, can you just orient us about that work in case people aren't familiar with it? Um, so uh, the Suppliants by East Phyllis, um, it, it's sort of slightly to be older to me, but that is certainly one of the oldest surviving tragedies. Um, and the story, uh, it tells the story of the daughters of Danaeus who are fleeing um, forced marriage with 
uh, their cousins who are the sons of Egyptus. There are, are 50 daughters, there are 50 sons, and they are fleeing marriage. They come to Argos and ask for sanctuary there. And the action of the play then um, all sort of centers around the decision Argos as to whether to bring them in. And there are attendant risks to doing that because there are very clear threats from the sons of Egyptus that if they do bring them in, then a declaration of war in, in, in a sense, um, uh, or do they leave them to the mercy of, of these marriages that they, that they don't want? Um, and that is the, that is the, the play um, as it survives. I, I believe, I think it's the, it's the first of the trilogy, isn't it? Because we know sort of thereafter that obviously they do, they do get taken in, um, but the sons of Egyptus um, sort of just defeat the city, the marriages happen, but then um, 49 of the, of the uh, daughters marry, uh, kill 49 of the sons on their uh, wedding night. And then... Oh, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm trying to remember it always was a while ago. No, 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 um, right. Then, but so, I mean, together. yeah, I mean, it's hard to think about some of these themes that are, um, could they be any more relevant to so many of the kind of uh, topical discussions that we're having right now? On the one hand, you know, a desire to help people who are fleeing, on the other hand, concerns about safety or bringing in uh, others, basically. Let, let's, let's, say, let's say others, right? Absolutely, and there's a huge sort of um, one of the one of sort of the central arguments within the play. It seems to me is about it's about identity, identity of identity. We're talking mm. about this absolute true Mediterranean world, such as fertile place for sort of cross cultural links. Strongest arguments of the of the daughters of Danaeus is that they are they are sort of the kin of um, of the archives through sort yeah. of you know, through their ancestors. So the sense of connection, right? Absolutely. That sort of um, you know we might define ourselves. You know, at this you know the archives might define themselves at that point as archives and separate to women, but actually quickly and easily trace back to really well. We come from, you know, we're from the same spot actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maria, I'm, I'm curious to see if you have any reaction to what we've been discussing or something else to add at this point. Oh, but you're muted. Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, I think what um, uh, our guest uh, today uh, is bringing, I think it's uh, a fascinating um, topic in what sense. It's not only re relevant to our, uh, you know, to what we are actually um, experiencing but i think that uh in a way it's uh some people and uh, i would like to uh, to point out for example to janet's and mine uh, background which is very common because in a way uh, our uh, ancestors had for example to migrate or to be forced to leave uh, from uh, Ottoman Empire from, uh, for various reasons. So what is really special about migration is that you, could, you realize that people who are born uh, you know, after this migration uh, takes place, the children in a way feel that migration in many, many ways left something like, uh, they, call it, they call it a trauma. But, uh, for example, I was raised with uh, stories from, from, from my uh, uh, grandfather and grandmother, how, for example, they left Ottoman Empire and they, and they actually were forced to, to enter uh, mainland uh, Greece. So their migration, although they were Greeks, uh, they actually they were forced to leave their place. So uh, although somebody would interpret this as homecoming, it was actually uh, the, uh, the it worked the other way around. Uh, so uh, as I, I as I told before, the, the, the migration is a 
is a multifaceted concept. It doesn't mean that you actually uh, live, uh, a, that you're coming back home or you are going away from home. It depends on why you are living. And I think that uh, today what uh, our guest done is, uh, is really, really very important. It, it, uh, it made us understand why migration is really important, why the sea is uh, important. Uh, I would uh, still, you know, stress this, um, what we call Mediterranean aspect. If, for example, you read uh, Gregor, uh, Gregory Nagy's uh, books, uh, 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 Pindar's Homer, you will realize how important um, Homeric poetry as the, the poetry uh, that connects, in a way, the Greek world, not to, as an uh, educational means, but as uh, a common legacy, as a common medium, as a common discourse. Uh, I think you will realize that this connectivity, this constant move, in a way, um, is still uh, relevant to today in many, many ways. So what do you say to that, Paul? I mean, uh, Maria is, has just brought a lot to our conversation here. I mean, two of the things that I see her bring out are, again, this idea of connection, right, within the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even, the, I think, the idea of uh, the trauma of the, of the family history of migration or just the trauma of, um, of that over the long term. I mean, how do you see that in terms of playing out uh, in identities, either in what you see around you or in, in your performance? I mean, has that kind of trauma, um, do you see and, that as part of it? Oh, please, Maria. Oh. And I just wanted to add, to, uh, to, uh, to, just to connect with, uh, to connect my point with, just, with Jack said about Pythian 4. In Pythian 4, we have the narrative, the long narrative of someone who moved from Thera, from Santorini, to Cyrene, Libya, you could see that in a way, then at the end, um, Pindar also is making a strong plea for Demophilus is coming home. So as you can see, this constant movement that everybody moves around and finds no place, uh, you know, to for uh, uh, for stability. I mean, stability is something very, very uh, relative. So you you see that this constant movement is embedded in Greek literature in many ways. And this uh, uh, instability, this constant movement is caused by many reasons. So this is what, the, yes, I better stop. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no, 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 it's interesting. I mean, I'm thinking about the way that you're pointing towards movement um, as the creation of identity, right? Yes. That's part of the creation, which in itself then creates stability, right? If you can create a yes. kind of identity. Well, that's, why, uh, that's why I brought Janet uh, and my background. For example, uh, as I told you, as soon as the name where my answers come from, I, I think that this, this creates almost automatically a bond, which is something that you carry it with you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, personally, I, I want to hear what other people have to say. I'd want to add one little thing. I think there's something um, very interesting about ancient Greek song culture and their interest in combining at the same moment motion and the, the, the concept of constant motion and the concept of being fixed. Okay. So I think about your image of that bronze Greek horse, right? On the one hand, uh, it's completely fixed and it's being dedicated a votive offering. On the other hand, um, you know, a horse is something that we instinctively think of, I think, as an object in motion. And we can point towards images such as Odysseus's actual moments of journey home that we get. Uh, his ship is then being compared to horse. I mean, I know that's a long tradition. There's a lot going on there. But uh, we can find all sorts of other examples of um, things like, you know, Socrates, the idea that Socrates uh, is on uh, a theory. So this is sort of Greg's, something we've been learning through our conversations with Greg Nash, which is that Socrates is... Uh, on the philosophical, through phys philosophical dialogue, uh, goes on a journey, right? A journey of the soul, journey of the mind. Uh, even though if we look at uh, 
you know, what we see in the writings of Plato about Socrates, one of the things that is said about him is that he left home less than anybody, right? He only went basically to serve for war and I think to, you know, do something for the Olympics and, and come right back. So on the one hand, was, he was fixed. On the other hand, he was moving all the time. Um, so I think there's something really interesting there, Maria, with what you're saying about creating some kind of stability through attaching identity to constant movement. All right, I was talking too much. Paul and others, what are other people thinking here? Um, uh, just, uh, I suppose, sort of, I mean, I'm really talking about personal experience, and I suppose I'll sort of talk about family kind of connection to that. And obviously, sort of, like, you know, like millions of other people, my, my grandparents came from Ireland and uh, emigrated from there because there was just no other... And no other option and um <clears throat> there's a, a line i don't know if anyone knows the band the pokes um but they're sort of a, a london irish kind of punk band and uh there's a it's called thousands of sailing which is about irish emigration to america um and one of the lines within it is um where, wherever we go we celebrate the land that makes us refugees uh which again i think so talks a bit about there are so many reasons for, you know, as Mary was saying, there are so many reasons for migration and there are so many then sort of potential responses to it about how you the sort of dif sort of define, you know, sort of how you define yourself thereafter, sort of, you know, and I suppose people, most people going to America sort of, you know, for a long time, American, Irish American, maybe then at some point they want to, you know, just be American or, you know, what, you know, sort of how do you connect yourself to, um, to your to your past um and and how much of the, you know how important is location to that as well which i think raises an interesting question about the athenian um sort of the athenian mythology which is that they're you know sort of born out of the local earth right but yeah. at the same time we have this um we know colonization and drive at, outward right which is so interesting all right, unfortunately, we're getting close here. It's 11.57, so I want to open up to see if we have any more comments and questions from our community members here. We're just scratching the surface, so um, we hope you'll share something here. Don't be shy. <laughs> Jack. I, well, I, I'm touched by these stories about um, people um, being pushed out of... Um, uh, you know, what's now Turkey or what was once, uh, you know, the, the land of which Troy was the headland. Um, Paul, you've got a, a passage where Tenedos is, is, uh, is a key and uh, Tenedos, it seems to be, a, um, you know, one of those uh, tail uh, pro prosopons uh, that, uh, um, are markers for uh, uh, for crossings, but, but but I wanted to say uh, more generally, you know, if we knew our genealogies farther back than the late Middle Ages, you know, we would probably know that you know we have uh, quite a few uh, ancestors who somehow survived some catastrophe like what uh, is described in the Homeric cycle of the, of the Trojan War. You know, if you look at, well, there's the legend of Brutus, uh, you know, settling uh, the uh, uh, UK, or what's now the UK, the British Isles, uh, you know, coming from, you know, after Troy was destroyed. Um, so I don't know what, uh, you know, how, how distorted that uh, that myth is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the reality. We just don't we just don't have records to to say who our who our um, grandparent. I know I have a uh, uh, an ancestor who was a um, uh, a subject of the Duke or the Doge of Venice uh, who emigrated to England. Uh, in the 16th century, yeah. uh, but I don't, you know, so he was on the Mediterranean, uh, but, uh, you know, how did he get there? We just don't know. But uh, the, the, 
as we read the, the larger history, we're really reading the sort of things that, that doubtless happened to, to our, own, our own ancestors. So when you go to look at, um, look at Russia and you see people who look like an Englishman, uh, you know, who've been in, in, uh, in, in Russia for as long as they know, you know, they, they are probably just the descendants of people who migrated north, whereas uh, the descendants of Brutus, you know, migrated, migrated west. Anyway, uh, there's, there's so much uh, uh, real history, you know, our own history embedded in, in the myths, I think. And, you know, the, this, these passages that you brought up, Paul, are just, uh, just really wonderful for illustrating both the East-West movement and the North-South movement. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Paul, you know, some of this raises another issue. I know we're all sharing our own, let's say, our family narratives, right, about migration. Um, and yet, uh, for every narrative about the people who arrive, there's a narrative about the people who are there already right? Um, could be a very different story or narrative presented. So, um, so, but I think it really raises the question, Maria, that you brought forth and Paula, you were asking us to think about, which is, uh, you know, these issues of identity um, and, and, um, and that the creation of identity around, around this topic. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, one of the ways that these sort of groups that migrate sort of kind of perhaps retain identity is, is through culture and song. I think sort of Irish are a good example um, of sort of, uh, sort of identity through kind of tradition of song and storytelling. Right, right, right. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. That's kind of true of the, of the Greek world as well, I think. Um, that sort of that, that's kind of true, true, true. Uh, Maria has a comment. Um, We're or over now, so we, just, we have to keep these short. I just, go, go, go. Yeah. I, I just want to add another aspect of migration, which uh, Greg Nash already written about. For example, it's the case of Alkman, who in a way migrated from Lydia. He, he was probably not Greek, and he, uh, he came to Sparta. Uh, so he was, uh, you know, a choral poet. He composed a uh, choral poet poetry, but he had to mi migrate from Asia Minor and to come to mainland Greece. Uh, okay, so here we are now at the very last minute thinking about this rich topic of the migration of the, uh, of the artist um, and the performer themselves. Oh, Paul, what can you do for us in about a, in 30 seconds or a minute on that? <laughs> well, uh, that's just a quick passage. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, okay. So this is this is um, Ithaca um, by Cavafy, oh. um, and I think it's a thing to kind of talk about. Uh, well, I'll let it speak for itself. As she set out for Ithaca, hope that the voyage is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. And cyclopes, and afraid of them, you'll never find things like that on your way. As long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. By Stragonians and Cyclopes, Wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Which is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when, with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbours seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume, of every kind, as many central perfumes as you can, and may you visit many Egyptian cities to get her stories of knowledge in your mind. That's what you are destined for, but do not hurry the journey at all. Wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting to make you rich. Without not set
you know, I, Paul, can you hear me? Unfortunately, I think we're, um, we're having a little bit of trouble with the audio, but I cannot express how deeply grateful I am for you for sharing these words of Kavathi uh, at the end of this hangout. Um, it's very moving to me. Uh, they're just a treasure and they're really the perfect words to end with. So with that, I want to thank you, Paul, for sharing your experience with us uh, as a performer, uh, as a reader, uh, as a scholar, as an educator. And I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, all our community members for everything they do. And um, we'll talk soon. Take care. See you soon. Bye.